Summer of 78, I had a summer job. Mother, the summer job was at Leak Street School. We would go up there and paint and do all of the janitorial work. And uh, something interesting that pertains to this message took place every day during that time. Between the hours of 11.55 a.m. and 11.56 a.m., never at 12 noon because she was never late. So between 11.55 and maybe 11.56, Mother Hattie Williams would walk past across the schoolyard where we could see her every day on her way to the noonday prayer service. Every day. She was so faithful to that trip that we began to set our time by Mother Williams. We would say it's almost time for Mother Williams to walk by. We could say in advance that Mother Williams will be passing through in just a few minutes. On days when we were consecrating, I knew my consecration only had three hours to go. When Mother Williams walked by. She was so faithful that Mother Williams became predictable. We could predict at nine that Mother Williams would walk by between 11.55 and 11.56 a.m. on her way to the noonday prayer. I wonder how predictable are we? I wonder, have we established a pattern over the years that is, that, that is so set that people can predict where we will be? Uh every Sunday, every Thursday night at prayer meetings. What type of pattern have we established? Are we predictable? Our text today deals with leaders, presidents, and princes who set out to use Daniel's predictability or predictableness against him. They knew that they could count on him to do certain things. He's predictable. He does it all the time at least three times a day. They didn't know that the God of Daniel was the God who said this, them that honor me shall I honor. First Samuel 2 and 30. And he's also the God who said this, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Psalms 105 and verse 15. In our text, Daniel, just a little information, is no longer a teenager. 
the opening of chapter 6, we are actually looking at 80 year old plus Daniel. And uh, the thing about him, he was 80 years or more old, and he had had by now a long and prosperous career. And this guy at 80 was showing no signs of slowing down. In fact, he had, uh, he had been promoted, if you look in chapter, at chapter 2, uh, not chapter 2, chapter 5. And uh, verse 29 says, Then commanded Belshazzar, who was a Chaldean king, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. They had promoted him. Now, you, you're talking about uh, uh, the promotions before. Now, he's the third man in the administration of the Chaldeans. Not bad for a minority person who was taken from his homeland as Jerusalem burned with fire, snatched out against his will. He had no say in it whatsoever and brought to a land that he was not familiar with, a language that he didn't know, a land full of strange gods with customs totally unlike what he had grown accustomed to. And what does this guy do? This Jew in the land of Chaldeans, he prospers. He gets one elevation after another. One promotion after another. He did not use the fact that he was a child of the captivity, that he had been forcibly taken, kidnapped, to as an excuse, he succeeded. I snicker when I hear many today uh, say that they can't succeed in this country today because 400 years ago we were slaves. And I say to those who tell me this, tell me that you were never a slave. I was never a slave. Don't hop on that. If something that happened 400 years ago, before you were born, your mama was born, your mama's mama, your mama's mama's mama, and we can keep going back. If that is going to stop you today, that says something bad about you. Especially since the conditions have changed so since then. So we find this minority. It's Jew. In the land of his captors, the land of the Chaldeans, modern day Iraq, Iran, up in that area, uh, Mesopotamia, Babylon, we find him being promoted. And then one of his prophecies, however, comes true. I won't spend time on it today because I, it would spend too much time to deflect from what I want to talk to you about. The Chaldeans, the mighty Babylonian Empire, is conquered. It was conquered by the Medes and the Persians. Just as, by the way, Daniel had prophesied. 
The Persians conquered Babylon. All right? So now it's a new administration. Darius, which is not a proper name, it is a title just as Pharaoh is a title. All right? So Darius was the Chaldean equivalent to the title Pharaoh. Darius is now the king. Darius is 62. This is according to verse 31 of chapter 5. So Darius the Mede took the kingdom being about three score and two years old. God had told them that they'd been tried in the battles and found wanting. So now it's a new day. Are you following me? A new king. The Babylonians now are children of the captivity in their own land. And you're talking about a caste system. You got the Jews who were captured by the Babylonians still there. So now Darius is king, and look at what happens when God's favor is on you. I hope you're listening to me today. Bible says in chapter 6, verse 1, And it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. Darius, praise the Lord, set up his kingdom. You're going to see in our text professional jealousy, racism, xenophobia, and all kinds of things are going to take place. And as we study chapter 6 today, and bear with me just for a few minutes, there are similarities between what we just preached to you last Sunday from chapter 3 to what I want to preach to you about today in chapter 6. In chapter 3, the stars of the show was three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In chapter 6, only one, Daniel. The other three aren't mentioned. I don't know if they were still alive by now because in chapter 3, they were teenagers. In chapter 6, Daniel is 80 plus. In chapter 3, the civil disobedience between Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they resist the king was public. In chapter 6, it's private. Chapter 3 was under a different era. The Chaldeans reigned. In chapter 6, the Persians reign. Chapter 3, the imperial edict implicitly required the Jews to bow down to an emblem of imperial power. And the three men refused to do so. On the other hand, in chapter 6, the people are forbidden to make a petition of anyone or to anyone other than the king. But Daniel continued to pray and to petition the God of the Bible. Amen. Although the goals were the same in both chapters, and that is to cause the people of God to bow to the devil, the reasoning, however, was different. In chapter 3, the goal was to get the young men to comply. They really, even though it was not an empty threat, nobody really wanted to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into a burning fiery furnace. They wanted them to bow to the image that the king had made. Had they bowed, they would have lived. In fact, the threat of the burning fiery furnace was to be a deterrent 
to keep them from not bowing. Now, I just said, though, it wasn't an empty threat because, as you know, when they didn't bow, they threw them in. But God gave them a miracle, all right? Well, the reasoning in chapter 6 is just the opposite. I'm going to show you where those who went against Daniel hoped they were counting on his being predictable. They came up with a way to get him because based on what they knew about him, he wouldn't stop praying. So they came up with a way to use his religion against him. That wouldn't work today. Because today, when there's a little pressure against our religious beliefs, we fold like a cheap tent. Today, when the politician takes a position that's contrary to the teachings of the Bible, we put other considerations ahead of our religious beliefs. I have been told for the last eight years at least 100 times that the problem with me is that I don't understand that you have to separate your religion from your politics. I've had people to say it with a with smug arrogance. What Pastor Wooden doesn't understand. So I'm the dummy. What he doesn't understand is that you separate your religion from your politics. And he, don't, he doesn't understand that. Well, you know what? Daniel didn't either. And, and, and those who set out to trap him said, so now the way this thing will work, I'm going to show you, is here's what we know about it. He's predictable. He won't stop praying. So now, if we can just find a way to just interrupt his prayer life, not for life, just for 30 days, which would, if he prayed three times a day, 30 days, that's just 90 prayers. If we do this, we're counting on him saying, I'm not going to stop praying. That's the difference. Are you with me? And their goal was not, their goal was to kill him because they didn't like the position that he was in. See, because I told you that he had been promoted as number three man in the administration of the Chaldeans. But check out what happened in the administration of the Persians. I told you, new day, new king. Guess what? New promotion. Daniel found favor with the Persians. Ain't that something? God is good. The Bible tells us that uh, the Persians, I just read, Darius set over his kingdom 120 princes which would be over the whole realm, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first. Now, uh, the 120 uh, satraps, or protectors of the kingdom, were scattered throughout the reign, the 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 kingdom of Darius, which covered Babylonia because he had conquered them. The purpose of these men, they were protectors of the king and the protectors of the kingship. And among these 120, uh, he also got three presidents, or the presidents were called premiers or they were heads, three presidents, 120 protectors of the kingdom, and basically they were, they were, it was a very, very 
intricate network of spies where everybody spied on each other. Everybody watched everyone else. The purpose of having to set this up, if you don't mind me teaching the Bible, was so that the king would suffer no losses. You see that? You see in verse uh, 2, last clause says, and the king uh, have no damage. That is, make sure don't nobody steal from the king. Make sure no one usurp authority that they don't have. So he set up this elaborate government system. Are you with me? So everybody is watching everyone. And uh, the Bible teaches in verse 3, then this Daniel. You know, when they got ready to charge him, they called him that Daniel. <laughs> Amen. But Daniel writes about it. He says, this Daniel, you see, uh, was preferred above the presidents and princes. Now, this is amazing. This is a new administration. Darius studies Daniel. And he says, you know what? And this is almost unheard of. This is a Persian king having conquered the land of Babylon, conquered the Chaldeans, and he decides as he set up his network to protect his money, his power, his kingship, he says the top man over everything, over everybody, will be a Jew a child of the captivity. He's not Persian. He's not uh, of the Medes. Are you following me? He's not of the captivity. He's not of Babylon. He's not of the majority. He is a child of the captivity. He puts Daniel over everybody. That's another promotion. When God's hand is on you, God's hand is on you. So uh, Daniel gets promoted again. Are you with me? Thank you, Jesus. And so after he was promoted, let, let me tell you why he was promoted. It was not a beauty contest as with Esther. I don't want to take anything away from her. It was performance. I won't get many amens when I talk about this. I won't get many, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow it down where you would think I'm not looking for any. So if I get one, I'm ahead of the ball game. The Bible tells us why he was promoted. The Bible says because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king sought to set him over the whole realm. Let me, let me simplify excellent spirit. Because sometimes we speak in tongues. And, that's what he had the Holy Ghost. He did, but that's not what he's referencing. Excellent spirit literally means that Daniel was an extraordinarily skillful and reliable government official. It means, to make it a little clearer, he was extremely loyal and reliable to his job the tasks that were assigned to his hands. He carried them out explicitly and exquisitely. He overlooked nothing. I talked this morning in leadership about the value of critical thinking skills. Daniel could think critically. This guy made the right decisions. Daniel had to go back and redo uh, jobs and tasks that were assigned to him almost never because Daniel applied himself and he got it right the first time. Also, he had a reputation. He could not be bought. Bribes couldn't get him. Amen. He, nobody had anything on him. He was not corruptible. Because he lived a clean life. 
the men who was closest to him knew he was clean. The king knew he was clean. He performed his task, and there were no areas in his job of negligence. You know, some of us do some things good. You know, most, most of us, most of us, I, I, I've been guilty, and somebody would probably say still am. We, we, we specialize and we hone in on and we, we stick to our strengths and ignore our weaknesses. But to really become good, at, the best at a thing, well, you, you got you to gotta keep your strengths strong, but you got to improve in your areas of weakness. You see, Daniel was a man who was thorough. He had the best ability, which was, praise the Lord, reliability. Then he had accountability and all the rest of them going for him. This guy was extraordinary. Everybody would want Daniel to work for them. Fortune 500 companies, what he could demand his own price because he's rare. We live in a society today where we've become experts at making excuses. Mediocrity is now the new goal. Most companies, the number one complaint of most businesses is that you can't hardly find qualified workers. Our children go to school and they play. Praise the Lord. Everybody wants to go to the NBA and the NFL, not knowing that if you make it, the average length of your career is about three years, and, and the money don't last forever. There has to be a sharpening of our skills. There has to be more pride applied to study and performance on the job. I'm, that's why I'm proud of you, the report you gave me, uh, Sister Carmen doing the job out there in a strange land with people you don't know, but you understand that God has you on assignment. Now, like Daniel, you're getting promoted, promoted, and promoted. Who is this East Coast girl getting these promotions? Someone who has in her an excellent spirit. The excellent spirit is not a reference to speaking in tongues. It is not a reference to casting the devil out. It is a reference. It is a professional reference to performing one's task the way that the task should be performed. It is a reference to improving and getting better along the way. It is a reference to doing the job Experience this message in its entirety by calling 877-463-3477 to purchase your copy in CD or DVD format. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day.